Go up here. Yeah. Let's, uh, we're in a church, and we have a slew of pastors here. So let's open this up with a word of prayer, okay? Lord, we thank you that we can gather here together as uh, followers of yours. We, we, we thank you for the concern uh, that we share for our city and for justice. And we pray, oh God, that you will guide us, uh, guide us in this uh, time together. Uh, we pray for our city. We, we pray for justice and we pray for peace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I thought we would take a minute. Come on over, Dwayne. Come on, come on over. The, uh, if you're here, you're participating. I thought we'd take a minute and just introduce the, the, uh, the uh, Grand Rapids pastors who are here in the room. And I have Dr. Goldstein and just work, work our way around. Dr. Lily Goldstein, First Community Church. Reverend Rachel Barr of Plymouth United Church of Christ. Reverend Adam Lipscomb, City Life Church. Reverend Christy Lipscomb, City Life Church. Sarah Moffitt, House of God. Bob Manuel, uh, Pastor of Boston Community. Uh, Josh Samarco, Pastor of City Life Church. My name is Phil Garrett, the Center of Faith. Pastor James Jones, Fort Bill Park Church. Jathan Austin, Bethel Empowerment, Jim Center. Wayne Kelvin, the only man who is the current Peter Kingwinkle, pastor at Oakville Park Church. Cindy Dion, pastor at Neil Nam Church. Sarah Van Zutten Bruins, pastor at Trinity Reformed Church. Jen Holmes Curran, pastor at Jones Street Reformed Church. Christian Reformed Church. Tony Holmes Curran, pastor at Sherman Street Christian Reformed Church. And Deb Coster, pastor with Christian Reformed Church. Okay. Thank you all for, for being here and thank you for coming. I'd, I'd rather have you stand. You can just grab seats somewhere and we'll continue on. Thank you very much. I am uh, Jack and uh, have served in this church, Grace Church, uh, for 17 years. Um, so I want to I want to uh, welcome you. For those of you who are not familiar with the Grand Rapids Association of Pastors, it was founded in 2014, and and uh, wanting to be aspiring to be a uh, diverse of pastors across the all. Ethnic uh, lines uh, to stand together uh, in the city for evidence of unity of the body of Christ, for recognition, and to pursue justice uh, in in the city. So, um, out of that, out of those aspirations, we have a statement uh, that will be read in a minute. I want to mention that um, I just want to mention that we're we're calling churches, pastors, and churches to. Sunday, Pentecost Sunday, Sunday, and in some way, justice for in some way to uh, to bring forward uh, these issues in, uh, within within their congregations. So, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Adam Lipscomb and uh, Jathan Austin to uh, just. So Adam Lipscomb and uh, Pastor to read the, the letter that uh, many of our pastors have, have signed. It is a time and a season. This is a time for anger. We ministers of Christian churches in Grand Rapids call for accountability for the killing of Patrick Leoya. Black residents of Grand Rapids, people of color in this community need to feel safe. To that end, actions must be taken. We stand with our colleagues in the Black Clergy Coalition and echo the NAACP, the ACLU, Urban Core Collective, A Glimpse of Africa, and other leaders who represent those most impacted by this incident in the following. A prosecutor of Kent County who does not work regularly with the must be appointed to handle this case as is legally required in many states and is widely acknowledged to be best practice. A federal investigation must be immediately launched into this killing along with the history and culture of the GRPD. 
The community must have a seat at the table in the ongoing negotiations over the GRPD police union contracts, which have for far too long shielded officers from accountability and which do not reflect the community's priorities for how to achieve public safety in our city. Both the Civilian Appeal Board and the Office of Oversight and Public Accountability must be given the authority, resources, and funding to provide true civilian oversight and be able to change. And the city and GR constitutional right of all people to protest this tragedy exercise their freedom of speech without violence, threats, or intimidation. Prophetic voices in our community have been crying out for change in the Grand Rapids Police Department for decades. We hear in these prophetic calls to action the declaration that each person is created in God's image. We recognize the call of the scriptures to do justice without showing favoritism. And we see the, the ministry of Jesus who is not only a reconciler of humanity, but is also the coming judge to set things right. These prophetic voices cried out for change when black boys were threatened with GRPD guns while walking home from playing basketball at the Croc Center. These prophetic voices cried out for change when evidence showed clearly that black motorists are twice as likely to be pulled over by the GRPD. These prophetic voices cried out for change when 11-year-old Honesty Hodges had a gun pointed at her and was then handcuffed by the GRPD in her backyard. These prophetic voices cried out for change when Gilmar Ramos Gomez, a U.S. citizen who is, who is multiple forms of identification over to Immigration and Customs Enforcement by the GRPD. The death of Patrick Loyo, Loyo has devastated families, most acutely his parents and the many members of the Congolese community and other immigrants from Africa. It has also devastated every person who watched the video of Patrick's death and understood that blackness itself is considered a threat. Too often, it is itself a death sentence. Yes, this is a time for anger. Our anger is appropriate, it is justified, and it is even holy. This anger is rooted in our deep belief in the dignity, the image of God that dwelled in Patrick Leoya. It is anger that is rooted in our ongoing belief in the dignity of God that dwells in Officer Sure, It is anger that comes from admitting that we have created, accepted, and actuated a system that trains an officer to discern that his best choice in that moment was to reach for his gun and pull the trigger. The gospel of Jesus calls us to work against racism. We commit to being agents of change in any system that makes this community less safe for black and brown people for as long as it takes to see change come. This over the long term. For the short term, we join with other organizations in Grand Rapids to call for the five points above. That is how our government can bear witness to the humanity and dignity of Patrick Leoya. Thank you. As of uh, right now, 70 pastors in Grand Rapids signed that statement. And if any of you do not have a copy and want to have a copy, we can make one available to you. Um, they're here. They're, so we have, we have copies of that statement available to you. We have a couple of people that would like to uh, say a few words, and we're here also to answer, to answer questions uh, in just a minute. But the first person I'd like to call up is, is Pastor Sam Moffat of the House of God Family Life Ministries. Good afternoon. As a part of the Grampus Area Association of Pastors, um, I am here to simply encourage us as a community uh, of believers in particular to unite around the value of life. Um, We've all watched the video and uh, we've watched life being taken 
unnecessarily. The question is, uh, could there have been another outcome? Given Patrick's behavior, could that situation have been handled in a way that he would still be here and his parents would be able to come to celebrate birthdays with him? And if the question is yes, uh, then as a community, we need to explore another way of policing, another way of having uh, uh, Af young African, young African Americans in these scenarios. Me, you've seen Adam and heard from Adam. Um, and you'll hear from others, and what you, you, you're hearing today is the voice of not the black church. You're not hearing the voice of the white church, but you're hearing the voice of the church here in Grand Rapids that has united around the reality that life matters. Um, with all of our imperfections, I agree that life matters. Uh, Patrick's life matters. Uh, Officer uh, Schur's life matters. Uh, and when there's a life taken needlessly and unnecessarily, uh, as a community of believers, we can't, we can't just be silent and say nothing and do nothing. And so that's why we're here today, because his life matters and we're, in, we're endeavoring to honor him, uh, honor his family's wishes, wishes as well as the Congolese community's wishes uh, to pursue justice uh, in his behalf. So we're appealing to the officials uh, of our community as, as a church. Uh, so let's set aside our biases, our, our, our uh, political preferences, and let's just do what's right in this instance. We also, uh, we've asked uh, Pastor John Mondi of the African Community Fellowship Church to uh, say a few words. Good afternoon, and um, it's good to be here with uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord uh, gathering under. Uh, such a circumstances where we're still grieving and mourning uh, the loss of a precious life. But before I say anything, I would like to in my gratitude and thanksgiving on behalf of the African immigrants, which I feel um, uh, not worth it to represent because it's not a monolithic community. Community, although we come from a, a spiritual, one of the spiritual leaders here, it's such a privilege to speak on their behalf. I just want to extend my thanksgiving to all the Grand Rapids citizens for the unity, for the one voice, and for the encouragement not only to Leo's family and not only to the Congolese community but also to the entire immigrant community. Uh, the the demonstration of oneness and unity in Christ and all people of this great city are showed was profoundly important and so encouraging. On well, other organizations also, uh, parachute organizations, non-profit organizations of all kinds, they showed one unity in um, and voicing out the need for justice and for equity and good neighborliness in our communities. I would like to, like to uh, send the thanks to the Renaissance Church that became like a community, uh, I mean the Congolese community, local church, spiritual um, encouragement and also providing a place for them to meet and conduct all their resources. May the Lord bless you for that. We continue to lament and we continue to grieve. One of the last meetings that I attended after the, uh, during uh, the funeral service, that was quite heavy. 
seeing the Congolese mothers cry and making statements such as, we celebrated and thank God to be out of the, uh, out of the uh, refugee camps with, 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 with the conditions and coming to United States. United States that is painted very rosy, very great country, a country that uh, demonstrates shalom outside the United States. And therefore, the expression was we have to find rest, to find true shalom, to, to be able to sleep and, 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 and enjoy life and see our children thrive. And here again, through the death of Leoya, uh, the re traumatization came back again. Whose child is next? What is going to happen to my child at school? And this conversation continue. The tears continue in this community. And therefore, it's so encouraging to see that there's a movement, not only in our entire community, but also the movement within the Christian community represented by us here today, that we will continue to speak on behalf of those that need voice. And there are cultural barriers. And therefore, it is so encouraging to see all of us gather here. So with our shortcoming in terms of cultural, um, uh, uh, cultural ways of doing things here in the United States, we have our dear brothers and sisters who lead us and encourage us, something that has been missing. And in fact, through this process, I have been contemplating, yes, as a black person, before the details, Leoya was just but another black man. And therefore, in the broader sense, uh, being black is uh, a broader universal uh, disadvantage to the black people, especially men. But when you come to the black community, it's not monolithic, as I mentioned. Um, especially the, uh, even, even those from Africa, we, we come from different cultural settings. And therefore, the, the theme of loving your neighbor, uh, the theme of loving the stranger and welcoming them, if that has to take place, then we have to take the nitty critics of getting to know each other well. These microcultures, you ask a very important question, could there be something else that could have been done in that video? Looking it from my Kenyan eyes as a, in, in the culture that I come from, yes. <laughs> yes. In Kenya, when you run from police, it's a, it, is, it is respectful for the police because you sure you run away from them. And therefore, when you run away from them, uh, they are very happy. But when you resist and stay there, uh, it, it is the totally opposite. These little cultural issues are important, and sometimes we overlook it. And I think as we converse and talk about the uh, social justice, I think the foundational issues has to do with the little things that light the fire. The little bring the fire in order to light the fire big. And those are little cultural dynamics that we need to engage with each other. And what a joy to be in the midst of brothers and sisters who care, brothers and sisters who uh, would like to see us lead, uh, create a little bit, uh, I, I used to sing in, uh, in, in Sunday school and say, let us create a little heaven down here as we look forward to uh, living in glory with God forever and ever. But we have to, uh, we, we have to reflect that here. And I think it's, nobody else can do that other than us. We are the mouthpiece of Jesus Christ. We are the proponents of the peace and the shalom that we are yearning for. And therefore, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Let us continue have of those mothers who continue to cry. Let us trust and believe that the Lord will shape and bring things to be better. And this city will demonstrate that things can change for the better in the, in the years to come. I look forward to a time when we'll gather here again and say, yes, we met. And things have never been the same for God's glory. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pastor. We'd like to be uh, available to answer any questions that you have, and I'd ask uh, uh, Pastor Jake Jason Austin and uh, Dr. Willie Golston and uh, Peter T. Winkle and Adam Lipscomb to come to come forward. And um, if you have any questions, we will attempt to answer them.
Is there any particular place we should be in order to ask questions or just stand up and ask? I think you should stand up and ask. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, thank you, um, and thank you for hosting this. I, I do want to ask, and as you read the statement, have you had contact with the prosecutor and given this to him already? Hmm. I don't believe I get to in contact with him, and we have asked him now on several occasions to accuse himself. That's what you're asking. His why he has refused to I've always been engaged in the midst of social justice, I'm preaching a social gospel. Oftentimes, the faith leader is the one that is most respected, the one that, that is there uh, during, during good times and times, so that we can make sure that faith is at the, at the heart. And last night, our works is dead. And as a part of us engaging in the midst of, of speaking and standing and, and trying to encourage and empower persons from the pew and in the congregation, we believe that can make the utmost difference in the midst of what we're going through in times like these. I think we can also say, like as Pastor Moffat said, this is about life and death. And we are adamantly for life for every human being in the limits of this city. And so what we might otherwise be numb to is something that we're told to accept. We're here to say one life lost is far too many. And then to also be a voice to say that it's not just one life, it's every mother and every relative and every friend and everyone who shares the same skin color who is now afraid for their life. And so as far as we're concerned, death is an enemy and we're standing up to stand against that and advocating for better and more just ways in our city so that everyone can live on their own plot of land, unafraid, enjoying all of the fruits of their living. I think it's also important to note that during times of election, politicians want to come to our churches to advocate their position. And we're being very clear, do not come and ask us for your vote if you're not putting police reform on the table. Do not come and ask us for your, our vote if you're not positioning yourself to advocate for our community. We're done with it. We want to see real change in our gun laws, and I saw today that New York State has already taken advanced placement to now move the age limit of when you can purchase a gun. They're not waiting for the government. So now we're seeing precedents made across the country. We want to see those same precedents made in our city. So we're telling any politician, it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you stand on, if you're not standing with us on these issues, you will not get our vote as a clergy community. I think that in, um, in response to so many things in our society right now, there is a polarized response. And so certainly I think that we're seeing that in, in this case as, as well. I think that the unique voice that the, the Christian community, that the, the church has in this, is that our loyalty is ultimately to, to Jesus and not to a political party. And so uh, we're able to stand apart and express the value that we believe God has for, for life. In, in this moment, and uh, the, the Christian church has had this long-standing uh, tradition of not um, not uniting with uh, with the government and in things like this, but to be able to stand apart and to be a prophetic voice in moments like this. And so uh, that's the role that we're wanting to take here. Coming when he said earlier, and I paraphrase, in the first 30 days, I want to meet with community where they are. Is that happening? Do you see a sincere voice for change at HQ? 
I believe that at headquarters, the chief has tried to be as, as transparent as he, as he can be. Uh, his schedule has definitely been open to meeting with persons, any group. Uh, he's willing to meet them constantly uh, in that capacity. Uh, and we have to recognize that this particular case in and of itself, I mean, we're talking 58 days from the time in which Patrick's life was taken. Uh, and granted, he has taken his steps. However, it's now in the prosecutor's hands. Uh, and, we're, and he's the one that's actually delaying what has transpired. Mm. And so therefore, in that particular regard, headquarters has done what they can do. Um, and we're just waiting. Uh, and we're tired of waiting. Mm. We're ready for that change. Bigger picture when it comes to reform within the, the department. Do you see change coming, forthcoming there? I, I believe that it, that it will be. Mm. I believe that it will be. Uh, the key ingredient is learning how to make sure that we don't let this fall through the cracks. Everybody is accountable in this capacity. I just want to piggyback on everybody's accountable in, in this uh, because we have seen, you know, this is not the first Grand Rapids Association of Pastors. This is not our first time interacting with the Grand Rapids Police Department. We have uh, spoken with multiple police chiefs now and we've seen changes in, in leadership over the course of, of years. Sometimes a change in leadership does not necessarily mean a change in systemic injustice. And so um, what we're calling for is systemic, systemic change so that our community is safer and that life is, is valued at a deeper level. I wanted to uh, affirm the statement that the association has put forward. I think it's a good, uh, solid list of demands that's important. So I congratulate you on that, doing that. Um, Two, two comments, and I would, would welcome you to respond to, to both comments. So first one is that uh, I think Jack mentioned there were 70 signatories at this point, uh, which there's roughly 800 churches in this community. Many churches have more than one pastor. So we're looking at maybe 5%, if that, mm. who have signed on to the statement. Mm. And of course, notably, it seems that there are an awful lot of white churches that have not signed on to the statement. So that's one thing you could respond to. The second thing would be is that um, while the statement is great and, and the demands are, are really solid, I, I think that in sort of the tradition of the black freedom struggle, actions like engaging in civil disobedience, if this body would be willing to do something like that at a city commission meeting or in some other capacity, um, and if you've never participated in civil disobedience, I've been doing trainings on them for 30 years. I'd be more than happy if some people, if y'all would be interested in doing that, because I think that would also yes, send a very strong message. Yes, sir. And I think it would also gain a lot of respect from the young organizers who yes, are sir. who are in the streets every day yes, sir. for the last two months Amen. almost. Amen. So, respond to either of those questions. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that the church has been of two minds, particularly the white church has been of two minds when it comes to any issue of justice. The, historically, the white church has been um, more than justifiably accused of being so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good, um, to use another cliche. So there's no doubt that we have work to do and that the, the white church in particular um, has has to take on the onus of the effort. Um, so there's, there, I just can't deny or, or speak around that. Um, but those of us that are here um, want to be the voice that that calls them to task for that. And I think the the theology that per, um, contributes to that heavenly mindedness um, also contributes to the lack of engagement in society too. That church and state are separate. Public and private are separate. Um, so we have issues that we have to tend to, and um, I can sit up here today and to tell you to, that I'll, I'm willing to do my part, we're willing to do our part with the white church um, that needs to step in and, and play the role that God has called us to play. I also want to say good, great points that you're making. I think also we can't be just linear in our approach to this. Um, as the clergy, um, what thing that we have learned is we're doing a lot of work behind the scenes, but we're not making that work known. And so we've got to do a better job of making sure you know that we're meeting with the county commissioners, that we're meeting with the mayor, that we're meeting um, uh, with the chief, because those things then bring impact because we're using our influence like now 
to say, let us be a voice openly so people can hear we're not okay with this. We're not standing back, being quiet. We're pushing forward. And so as the protesters in the streets are doing their job, we feel like it's necessary for us to step up and do ours. That I think hand in hand, we create the community that we want. Um, so that way everybody is doing their job and their assignment. I don't think we're focusing on 70. I think we need to focus on the diversity of the 70 that signed. Mm. If we get caught up in the number, it's just a number. But we need to get caught up in the fact that you have black, white, Latino, Asian, an entire community of 70 that represents our community. If we swab our community, you see the 70 in that community. And so we're swabbing our community to let this community know we're not okay. So there is a greater majority, and yes, we can get 1,300 signatures, and that would be phenomenal, and we can. But we want to step forward now and say we have enough swab of our community to say this is not okay, and that we want to bring real healing, real restoration to not just the Congolese community, but to the black and brown community that serve, that pay taxes, that live and raise their families, their children, and they don't have to be scared. I've got a 19 year old, he's not even driving right now. I don't even want him to drive right now because I don't know what will happen to him when he leaves my house. I guess what I'm asking, I know if there are people who will watch this and they'll say, well, is this a letter? Are you just signing it? You know, obviously there's work going on behind the scenes, but what makes this different from other petitions that have been signed by you know, thousands of people across the nation I do think that um, the people who have signed the letter are pastors and they represent the whole congregations. And so I, I do think that uh, those 70 signatures represent thousands of people in our community who would like to, to see change in, in this regard. And, um, you know, you're asking pastors these questions, and so my answer is a, is a pastor. I think that a lot of times when um, you ask a pastor about power, we just would express it differently. We don't think that power ultimately comes from popularity or from having the majority of people behind you. These are 70 people who are representing thousands of people who are, who are praying and who are, are digging in, who are, um, who are uh, calling on both heaven and earth uh, for, for change in, in this regard. And so, yeah, we do think that, that we can make a difference and that we've been called to do so in this moment. The expectation. Um, I think maybe that's the best way to look at this. Because pastors have power, right, from the pulpit. Pastors also have series that they get wrapped up in. They want to get through those series. I mean, what is the message to the congregation? How does this get through other than the 70 signatures? How do you reach your congregations? So uh, we're calling on churches this Sunday, Pentecost Sunday. Um, which is a, a Sunday traditionally uh, in which we celebrate the, the giving of the Holy Spirit to the church uh, to empower the church for ministry and the outbreaking of, of the church from a um, particular ethnic group to, to multiple ethnic groups. We're calling on, on the church to use this Sunday to, in whatever way their tradition um, would, would allow for them to, to, bring, um, to bring their uh, their interaction with each other and with God to bear on, on this situation. So uh, we're expecting that churches would do something this, this coming Sunday. Um, and uh, we think that, um, that that will, that will be a, that is, that is the next step. That is the call to action that we're, that we're calling on uh, right now. This Sunday churches will, will do something significant to, um, to address this from a Christian perspective among their congregation members. And when did you, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I just, I wanted to say, out of that 70, how many of your congregation had members that were already participating in the, the marches hmm. that had taken place? Hmm. It's a great question. I was going to add that piece is that 
you know, people indict the church and say the church needs to do more in the community. They do. And, and that's a fair indictment if you don't understand that the community comes into the church. Amen. So no one lives in the church. We were able to speak to the community and then those that we speak to go out and do the actions in the community. So a lot of our influence happens because the leaders in the community are sitting under our voice. A lot of the leaders and those that have the ability to affect change are hearing us from the pulpit. What we can't do is not use our pulpit to speak to the issues. We can't just preach heaven and not preach the issues that are in the earth. We have to make it make sense and when we do, then it allows those to be empowered to go back in the community, to go back in the offices, to go back in the boardrooms, to go back in legislation and say, you know what, I do have the Holy Spirit behind me, back me. I don't have to fear. I will speak up in this injustice. Now, oh, in terms of this collective effort, when did this begin? Like, what was that moment? Was it the video? Was it when you heard about it? Like, what was that moment for you all when you like, we need to do this statement, we need to put, you know, works behind faith? In actuality, when we, when we first heard about it that morning, um, members of the Black Clergy Coalition had gathered together and said, oh no, this is, this is, this is not enough. We, we met really that day down, downtown <laughs> and, and were made, made aware certain things through various, various forms of media. Um, and we shared it with, we said, we're not in this alone. It's a both and not an either or. And so, uh, with the power that comes through collective work and responsibility, it's imperative that we take advantage of every moment so that we won't keep repeating the cycle. Because it's causing all of us pain and hurt. Uh, we're, we're frustrated, we're mad. Um, individuals are empathizing with each other. We want to make sure that this one Grand Rapids really is going to come together and be serious and adamant about making a difference for change. And that starts with us collectively working together. So from, from day one up until now, until beyond this, beyond, so that we won't be able to see what happens next. Um, anything, any violence or anything that is going to occur, we're praying for peaceful demonstrations. But we want to make sure that our voices are heard um, in all capacities, from the election, election booths, to uh, calling our congressmen um, all across the world. We're going to make sure that this is, we're adamant and serious about holding everybody accountable in this capacity as one family. Yes, it, when, when you're not in the, the crime scene far away and you hear from the news, uh, there is a little bit of skepticism of waiting what, what could have been there, but I think that video cleared everything for most of, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, speaking on myself, and uh, looking it in the cultural eyes, the, uh, the African uh, immigrant cultural eyes, uh, it, it was just a moment that there's something that needs to be done because there seems to be a disconnect in terms of who is, who is in this town, who are these people. Uh, Grand Rapids is not the same as it used to be, say, 30 years ago. It's just like a melting pot of immigration and I think it should be a turning moment for the city to begin to rethink asking this question very critically who is who is my neighbor nowadays who is here and, and uh, when we do not answer that question then we'll run into hums and bums and mistakes and I think this conversation should continue going down to those small foundational issues that will make life livable here uh, when we know each other's uh, behaviors, how we live uh, in those small micro cultures that will melt into this broader culture that we live uh, called the United States. So yeah, for me, it was the, the video that said, whoa, there's something wrong here in terms of who, is li who lives here. And now if, if, even the relationship with the police and the community, we come from different, uh, different settings and now, Walking within a system that's already there, uh, things like this happen. Yeah, this conversation needs to continue going down to the foundations. There have been a lot of calls for accountability and justice. What does that look like for us? What is justice actually? 
That is such a great question. Thank you for asking because we've learned so much. We've learned that protesting is great, but if we don't change and reform the systemic laws that protect these officers that can shoot someone and their name not even be mentioned, these are issues that go far beyond what we're even saying here. So that's why we've got to go to legislation. That's why now we've got to tell our politicians, you do not have our support because we're doing this work now because we want to see real results. Those results now need to take place that does not protect officers in these instances. These instances now need to be reformed so that we all feel safe and legislation cannot protect them and they can't hide behind them. One of our, our calls to action is the community must have a seat at the table in ongoing negotiations over the GRPD police union contracts. We've learned over the course of years before this incident, um, Grand Rapids Association of Pastors has been uh, connecting with the, the police over a variety of different injustices. Um, that often it is the protection of the, the unions that, that causes the systemic injustice to persist. And so I think that the, the demands that we've put together are um, ones that uh, have been, you know, they're, we share them with many other organizations, but uh, we've also seen by experience that um, these are some systemic points, friction points, that if we were able to make some movement there, we might see uh, the needle move. And so yes to all of that, 100% um, systemic change needs to happen, um, but I just want to add, relative to the humanity and dignity of a, an individual, I want to be able to go to people and say, do you trust people in charge and have them say yes. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to go to citizens of Grand Rapids and say, do you feel safe to ride your bike or drive a car or walk down the street without being harmed? And if they can answer yes to questions like that, then I'll know that the systemic changes we've made have been, have been just. Um, so I, that's just, a, I think, an important layer to your question as well. How have city leaders responded so far to the, uh, the demands? Hmm. Yeah. 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 Have they been sent the letter? To answer your question, it sounds like they've been been made aware of the of the letter. It's, it was a public letter, um, and uh, so yeah, that they, they um, I mean that they're asking for it sounds like uh, for for a meeting with with us, um, but yeah, we don't have any inside insight into how they're responding. You guys have mentioned that there was some work behind the scenes being done, so I'm sure at least components of these demands have been brought up to city leaders since uh, Patrick's sure. death and killing. Uh, what has the response been? So Adam has stated something that's very um, critical to them. this work has been going on for a while. The NAACP has been put together a list of demands and uh, things that they had asked for, as well as the Black Clergy Coalition, and we have yet to see these things happen. Hmm. So we have yet to see them really act with real results to see change happen. So that's why now we feel like it's imperative for us to turn the heat up because what oftentimes happens is we meet in these back rooms, private conversations, and you're pacified. But now we recognize that we cannot stay in those back rooms. We've got to speak out openly to say these are our demands so the community and the public knows now this is what we're asking for because that pressure needs to be placed on our community leaders. Are those, I'm sorry, are those community leaders aware of your anger? I know when they opened the statement, the um, pastor said, now is the time for anger. Are they aware of this? And I, I guess my follow-up question is this, is, how, how long do you plan to fight? And I don't, gosh, I wish there was a better way I could say that. But I've covered these stories time and time again. And there's always resistance, 
resistance, resistance. And over time, you see the person wear down and down and down. How long do you plan to fight? We plan to fight as long as, long as it takes. We, this, I wish that Patrick Loyoya's death was a one-off instance and that there has not been, um, there's not been injustice in the past. There has been, and we've been addressing this over the course of, of years as the Grand Rapids Association of Pastors and just as pastors. Um, we have, have been addressing this. We, we recognize we live in a broken world and yet um, we have an ongoing and persistence, persistent uh, um, you know, we're, we're not going to let it go. Uh, we're we're going to keep keep going after it. Yeah, we want to see a real change happen in our community. I like to add to what Adam has stated is the pain of watching Patrick's death. We didn't just watch a man get shot; we watched a man get executed. That pain is immeasurable and I believe has stirred the pot. For the first time in our community, I've been here 15 years, I've not seen us walk hand in hand with the Congolese community, with the diversity of the passion of white, black, and brown pastors. For the first time since I've been here, I've seen a collective community with one voice saying enough. So if Patrick's blood spilled in the streets of Grand Rapids, I believe has fueled the passion to say we're not stopping until real change has come. And we're going to do it together this time. It's not just isolated voices. It's a sound from Grand Rapids that is echoing to this community we're not taking anymore. John Mondi, African Community Fellowship Church. First Community a &E Church. In your names. In your names as well, super. Dr. Willie Golston, First Community a &E Church. Jathan Austin, Bethel Empowerment Church. Peter T. Winkle, Oakdale Park Church. Adam Lipscomb, City Life Church. Uh, John, is there a way you think the community in Grand Rapids, the people of Grand Rapids, how do they show their support to the grieving family and the grieving communities they're close to? What's your sense of what the people of Grand Rapids, the regular citizens, the ones with signs, the ones weight marching, but they got signs, what do those people do to, sh to, to support this family? Uh, what does your faith, you know, anything? Thank you very much. I, I think I echo my brother's uh, observation that this uh, has brought us together in a very profound way. Um, since this happened, it's been, uh, as, I, I, as if you recall my introduction, uh, as African community, we are so grateful that uh, what we have seen is just embrace of love, uh, care, uh, empathy, um, encouraging the family. Uh, but in terms of uh, the direct um, help to the Congolese community and particularly uh, Leo's family, I think within the glimpse of African health organizations uh, within the Congolese community, they have the, uh, the, the, the different ways, these, uh, uh, whether it's physical uh, um, help or visiting the family, they have those ones. But in the general observation in terms of uh, Walking this together uh, as, 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 as a Grand Rapids community, there's never been a, a hole of coldness that we have felt, but only warmth. Mm. We have seen the hand of Christ with all of you, with everyone else, with everybody in the community, whether they are Christians or non Christians. Uh, this, uh, this is death really has brought us together, and uh, that's why it's good to uh, use up this power in terms of uh, uh, continuing to speak about justice to reach that imperfect 
before we get to heaven. Um, good neighborliness and good brotherhood and sisterhood as we coexist together in our communities. I do think that it's important as the Christian community and as the Grand Rapids community that we uh, that we're in conversation with the Congolese community, particularly the Congolese pastors. Um, I think a lot of times we uh, do what we think is right in a, in a moment without asking how people would like to be helped. And so I would encourage all of our community to um, listen well to the Congolese community right now. The father and the mother of Patrick um, are very clear with us as well that we are in communication with them and they're assessing their needs. You know, um, I love what Pastor said is they are, as you can imagine, grieving while at the same time trying to figure out justice. And so through this grief, they're trying to assess what you can imagine every day has to be a day that's difficult to wake up in. So we're giving them the time, we're asking the community to give them the time to assess their needs, but we are in communication with them. And they are very appreciative, as Pastor said, that they know the community's waiting and here for them um, but what they have asked, they said to us, is please be peaceful in your approach. Please represent us in the way that represents Christ. Because we are believers and we want people to know that we are believers. I think right now um, our focus really needs to be on making sure the family's okay. I think any GoFundMe issue is an issue that we can address at appropriate time, which I'm sure will be addressed. But I think right now the family just needs to know we care. We're there and uh, if we have to send support directly to them, they'll get what they need. Okay, thank you uh, for coming. Uh, thank you all who participated in this in this event. Again, if you uh, would like a copy of the statement, uh, Natalie is in the back of the room with copies of our statement. And uh, thank you so much for coming. Appreciate it. What's your name in church, Pastor? I'm uh, Jack Corman, um, and I'm Pastor Emeritus at the church that we're in, Grace Christian Reformed Church.